welcome back to Radically Rethinking Railways in Australia with the Mad Professor as your tour guide and personal trainer. We bring you these episodes to help you train yourself to avoid lazy thinking that might have gotten in the way of your clear understanding of the problems of Australian railways. We travel the world on this escorted tour because so much of the nonsense about Australian railways that you have come to believe can be swept away by checking out how everyone else does it. Going overseas gets you out of the bubble of Australian commentators, whether they are politicians or bureaucrats, commentators in the industry, or just the poorly informed enthusiasts and advocates. Just a single plane ticket can shake that off. So for your benefit, we travel the world to Morocco in our fourth episode, to wartime France in our episode on mainline electrification, or 1990s Britain, contemporary California, Singapore, you name it, we've been there to help you understand how these false narratives you've heard about are just a pack of lies. Some lazy thinking in Australia has put down many of our problems to the use of multiple track gauges over the years. To be obvious about it, of course it doesn't help. Many enthusiasts like to recount the vaudevillian joke that O.S. Nock relays in his famous book, Railways of Australia. The joke about the Englishman, the Irishman and the Scotsman. Let's start with the Irishman, Shields, who as an engineer for the Sydney Railway Company in the 1850s decreed the Irish gauge of 1600 millimetres or the length of Brian Boru's sword should be the national gauge for Australia. An Englishman Wallace came in to replace Shields and decreed the worldwide standard of 1435 millimetre gauge be used instead. But he neglected to inform, let alone compensate, the Melbourne and Adelaide companies already embarking on the Irish gauge at Shields' instruction. And then the Scotsman came into Queensland and selected the 1067mm gauge, which became known as Cape Gauge, due to its widespread use in South Africa, though this neglects its wide role here in Australia, or in Japan. The problem with this joke is that it isn't funny, in terms of what it has done for Australian rail. In the 1850s it had little bearing on the colonial rail networks, they were independent of each other, but as they met at the colonial borders it became far more problematic, especially at the two major crossings at Wollongarra and Albury. Goods needed to be transshipped, and passengers changed trains. Arguably, the whole cities of Albury and Wodonga got their start from this need for transshipment, though interestingly, you can't say the same for the twin villages of Wollongarra or Jennings, which are scarcely larger than the villages of Serviston and Wolseley on the Victorian South Australian border, where the gauge was the same and no transshipment was necessary. Not all transshipment locations were on borders. South Australia, for reasons only it knows, had several changes of gauge within its territory, largely driven by the use of the Cape gauge instead of the Irish gauge for large parts of the network. Places like Mount Gambia, Wolseley, Port Pirie, Port Augusta, Tarawi, Gladstone and so on. And that is before adding the Commonwealth Railways, which inserted itself between the South Australian and Western Australian Railways with the New South Wales and Worldwide Standard, thus causing the need to transship between what would have been two Cape Gauge Railways and then the Commonwealth, to further compound the stupidity, built lines to Alice Springs and down from Darwin, on the Cape Gauge too. It was a mess all over the country, adding time, cost and complexity to the Australian rail network that was otherwise not a particularly large or remarkable one. Proposals to fix this have a long history too. They started before the Federation, continuing in its early years, and were punctuated by the different wars where having to move large volumes of goods 
and soldiers from one system to another. Already under the strain of having fewer employees, it generated committees and reports to suggest a single unified gauge system. A single gauge route from Sydney to Brisbane became available in 1930 and from Melbourne to Sydney in 1962, followed by Sydney to Perth in 1970, then Adelaide to Perth in 1982, and finally the Melbourne to Adelaide line was made compatible in 1995. Lesser routes to Mount Gambier, Alice Springs, Mildura, Albury and Esperance have also been converted. But this wasn't all positive. The 1970 project undermined several branch lines in northern South Australia, while the 1995 project destroyed lines to Mount Gambier and undermined lines in Victoria's wheat belt, even hundreds of kilometres from the converted track. And in Victoria in particular, the gauge conversion projects have been notorious for not connecting things up. Little of Melbourne's trackage was dual gauged in 1962 and the 1995 project disrupted point to point journeys that could once have been done on a single gauge. And in Victoria in particular, vast billions have been spent on lines to Bendigo, Ballarat, Shepparton, Bairnsdale, and others that could have been gauge converted at the same time. And sadly for rail enthusiasts, the popular day train from Adelaide to Victor Harbour, hauled by steam, was stopped when the line to the junction was converted. Lines have been converted that have not endured to Leonora or the earlier Cape Gauge to Irish Gauge conversion in Mount Gambia numerous South Australian branch lines, Victorian lines to Portland or Yarpeet hang on by a thread. So gauge conversion isn't the panacea some hoped for. And let's not forget our smallest gauges. The smallest gauge networks are the Queensland Sugar Networks, which we will cover in a future episode. Above them were the rare 762mm gauge lines independent of each other in the mountainous country of Victoria. The most famous is the Belgrave to Gembrook line, itself a beneficiary of gauge conversion, when the earlier line from Upper Ferntree Gully was rebuilt to allow the Irish gauge. So which gauge is the best? An instinctive reaction from most advocates and enthusiasts would be either the widest one on the alleged grounds of stability in operation or the worldwide standard. None of them are. In truth, the most stable gauge is the narrowest of the main gauges, the Cape Gauge. It is the one that has run the fastest trains. The electric and diesel tilt trains of the Queensland Railways have both exceeded 215 kilometres an hour and thus set Australian rail speed records on this gauge. Regular electric trains on the Queensland and WA networks both have trains that reach in excess of 140 km an hour, faster than any electric trains on the Irish or worldwide standard gauges. Some will point to the desirability of stacking trains high, with double stacked containers or semi-trailers on flat cars or double-deck passenger cars. None are relevant. We have the history of stacking semi-trailers on flat cars to Mecca Thara, Alice Springs and south from Darwin, back in the day on the Cape Gauge. Japan and South Africa have both run double-deck passenger cars on the Cape Gauge. And looking at the dimensions of the New South Wales double-deck V-set, which we looked at in episode 14, Our Finest Hour. We should be able to run on the Cape Gauge, provided everything else checks out. A stable and well-maintained track should also hold the double-stacked containers. It might be said 
that because the cape gauge would be so much less forgiving of the lateral forces that might tip over a train, therefore it must be better maintained. How is this a bad thing? Here we are in Switzerland, about to board a mountain train. In early 2023, your mad professor took the train from the dual gauge platforms of Lucerne to Interlaken to meet up with another narrow gauge train on the Montreux or Blanc Bernois Bahn, which would continue across country to the western part of Switzerland. The line to Brunig is rack assisted, something we will cover in a future episode. Unfortunately, from Brunig to Interlaken was replaced by buses so we missed the opportunity to connect with the Golden Pass Express at Interlaken. This train has become famous for its gauge change capability. It can operate on the same journey on both the worldwide standard as well as the meter gauge, which is common in Switzerland. The train alters its own wheel sets, as well as changing its body height to enable it to access platforms of different heights. Why did Switzerland adopt at least two gauges? Because, unlike in Australia, it was never going to be a barrier for them to operate a successful rail network. Switzerland has one of the most efficient, punctual and well-built railways in the world, yet you never hear of the gauge issue, despite the fact that it is everywhere. There are dozens of places in the small territory of the Confederation where you need to change from one gauge to another. The Swiss knew that to ascend the summits of mountains, that a narrow gauge would be needed. So the Swiss have quietly and efficiently tackled the problems of gauge change by good technical solutions like automatic gauge changing and by dual gauging, such as you see on the Brunig route into Lucerne, and by just running a damn good, efficient railway that has timetabled and reliable connections nearby in Austria. They had a famous approach of loading standard gauge wagons onto very narrow gauge flat cars and conveying them across that network. It looks like that has now stopped, but this could have been used more widely in Australia, whether from Maree to Alice Springs or from Colac up to Beach Forest on the Victorian 762mm line. Ideas have been floated in Australia for gauge changeability whether compound axles, where two running surfaces are built into the same axle. This would necessarily be a slow speed option on these wheels, but for many of our low traffic branch lines, enough. Or telescopic axles, as we have seen in Spain. Spain is another country with a mixed network. Once upon a time, it was two gauges, the dominant Iberian gauge but also a northern narrow gauge network in the Basque lands. To this has been added the worldwide standard gauge high speed network, connecting the south and the west of the country through Madrid and Barcelona to the French border. And Spain, through its indigenous builder Talgo, has built trains that run both on the wider gauges, either to reach the rest of Europe or to provide high speed service across the mix of Iberian and standard gauges to those cities in Spain that don't yet have the standard gauge only high speed network. Talgo has many times offered to run its trains in Australia and every time it has been rebuffed by our bureaucrats, presumably because it makes them look bad. Most people know the main network is the worldwide standard here in the USA and really all remaining commercial railways are that gauge. Like Australia, its early history, particularly in the southern states, was of lines built to a multitude of gauges. These lines were intended, like Australian ones, to ship agricultural products to the nearest port and were the legislative responsibility of individual states. So like Australia, no great thought was given to forming one unified gauge network. Unlike Australia, there was a major war between northern and southern states and the Union government had to convert the southern railways to the worldwide standard as they reconquered more territory. We know this because Charles Dana, Assistant Secretary for War under Lincoln, wrote about the war in the 1930s when he was a very old man. His account tells us that while the railways were privately owned, 
the union forced them to change gauge and then build them for the cost afterwards on the grounds that the lines were now much more valuable and useful as part of a national network. So for the USA, the gauge issue was basically the same as Australia, but the imperative to fix it with all its expense made by wartime exigency and the defeated forces made to pay the cost. Not that your mad professor would ever advocate a civil war, but this was an unexpected benefit from it. Like Australia, the USA also had major networks of narrow gauge, and they covered significant territory. These lines were avowedly constructed to narrow gauge to save cost, which a private builder would always need to think about. How to get the most railroad for the least cost. The most notable were in New England, California, and here in the Southwest where the network that became the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad covered much of Colorado, New Mexico and Utah. That railroad later converted much of the network to standard gauge. Thankfully for enthusiasts, several large stretches survived intact with steam locos into the 1960s and transitioned into preservation. For that, we can thank the Durango and Silverton Railroad, Combres and Toltec Line, which skirts Colorado and New Mexico, and the lines nearer Denver. These lines show the feature that even with a very narrow gauge of 914 millimetres, a good 15 centimetres narrower than the Cape gauge, they still produced large and robust rolling stock and ran at good speeds. The Silverton line has appeared in numerous films because it is so photogenic, including the third Indiana Jones film, the Nolan film called The Prestige, and others. The narrow gauge certainly helped get the Colorado lines into very rugged Rocky Mountain country with sharp curves, gorges, and high bridges, a treat for train lovers. Some other lines have gone into preservation from the Denver and Rio Grande Western Standard Gauge Network, but these lines too were originally built narrow gauge. That private company found the imperative of converting many of its through lines to standard gauge early in the piece. But the fact that the rest survived into the 1960s shows that the US found ways of coping with gauge change and unlike Australia, did not use the small gauge as a reason to build locos and rolling stock that were too small to be useful. And we see this in Australia, admittedly with an extra 15 centimetres over the Colorado network. Our Queensland coal trains and WA freights on the narrow gauge and even our Tassie system we covered in episode 15 Treasure Island run quite heavy trains with the Queensland ones giving the heaviest haulage in the Pilbara a run for its money. It certainly contributes to the idea. If Australia had really wanted an ideal gauge for all its network, Cape gauge would have been the cheapest but also capable of the heaviest hauls and fastest passenger trains. However, as we see in the USA, some of that cost saving is being able to access rugged country with sharper curves and less substantial earthworks, which is fine for branch lines that only handle goods, but was unfortunately a feature of our main lines, particularly in New South Wales, Tasmania and parts of Queensland, condemning our railways to not being fit for mainline use. It's not to say you can't build capable and fast Cape Gauge lines, but we should question a bureaucrat's motives. This accords with what we were saying in our episode, those were the days, my friends. It would have been defensible in the 1850s to build that narrow gauge network as cheaply as possible. But like our friends in Denver, we should have been replacing all that substandard alignment in the 1920s to compete with emerging road and air transport. And here in Japan, they consciously added the worldwide standard gauge to their Cape Gauge network to make it feasible to run beyond 220 kilometers an hour on new alignments with their famous new main line or Shinkansen projects which started in the 1960s. By building these lines, Japan recognized that they were adding complexity to their network, but did so in a way that maximized the efficiency of the network. In many cases, they used new out of town stations, but with easy interchange via the Cape Gauge network onto trains on that network. The word Shin in Japanese and Chinese means new, and by having stations named Shin Osaka and Shin Aomori, 
it conveyed not just that the station or locality was new, but that it was associated with the new main line. When the cost of getting trains to smaller provincial cities like Akita or Yamagata became an issue, they just converted the track to the worldwide standard, which allowed through running of Shinkansen trains, but at lower speeds. And finally, they came up with the fast tilt trains like the QR ones that can run on the Cape Gauge network. The topic of the Japanese network as a whole will come up shortly in a future episode. These overseas examples and many others illustrate how gauge is not really the barrier that our bureaucrats and commentators make out, but has become another fig leaf for their poor performance. If we consciously set out to run a network as efficient as the Swiss, or as technically minded as the Spanish, or even just applying brute force of funding and engineering that they used in Japan, we could have conquered our gauge issue, not necessarily by converting anything, though that could have helped. Our failure to do it in the early years only made it harder when, by the end of the 20th century, funding for any rail project was hard to get. And when the taps opened in the early 2000s, for example, the Victorian Regional Fast Rail, or the Adelaide Electrification, or earlier work on the Brisbane to Cairns and Mount Isa lines, work could have been smoothly integrated into those projects to re-gauge those lines at the same time. Imagine we are able to get a single train full of veggies from Innisfail or Tully down to Melbourne or Perth without a change of rolling stock. That we can't do this is not an engineering issue, but a bureaucratic one. We had many years where the physical break of gauge was a hindrance. But really, the actual break of gauge, the mental one, that existed inside the heads of bureaucrats, was the greater obstacle. We look to the Victorian and South Australian border at Serviston, those unnecessary stops for locomotives to be changed over, those vast yards of rolling stock being shunted, passengers hauled off the train in the middle of the night, for nothing. It was all the same track gauge. It was just that the bureaucrats couldn't handle the flexibility a single gauge would give, and insisted on all the fluffing around anyway. And now we have the Inland Rail Project. We see the same fluff-ups with this project, we saw in earlier years. While no practical changes will happen in Victoria or New South Wales, when the line crosses into Queensland, it should be superseding the South Western network. And it could easily do this by providing dual gauge, a standard and Cape gauge track, to the advantage of all services that currently run in this part of the world, and will in future. But further, once the traffic's on this line move away from Cape gauge, that extra rail could be removed from the sleepers. Instead, we are likely to see a crazy mix of lines into Toowoomba around the Gundawindi area and near Brisbane because no bureaucrat wants to stick their neck out and propose something efficient. Too much turf warfare and minor squabbles to cooperate on something better than this. With $25 billion at stake, an even half-intelligent bureaucrat should be able to think of something. The Swiss can speak four languages, yet we can't even speak one. Next time and we'll be taking a short break till then. We look at how low you can go with track gauge and still do heavy haul. Such a good idea. We wonder why other industries have failed with this. This episode will give you a real glucose hit. Take it away, Archies. It's time for Sugar Sugar. See you then.